Okay. Uh, I've put up some critical dates and information on the board. This is the usual close to the when things are coming up due. Assignment due is due by midnight tonight. For those of you that have gotten familiar with the date formats, that should look familiar. That's the end of the day. Um, the drop dead date is next Tuesday, which means after Tuesday, it's automatic zero. Then I start grading so I can get this grading out of the way and dealt with. Test two, drop dead tonight at midnight. You're already taking a 10% hit. 10% hit's better than a zero. Get her done. I like giving out zeros. I don't have to look at it. You save me work. Lab nine. Remember I said don't do lab nine because it's not fair or something to that effect? I've replaced it with a short quiz that covers the same material as what I'm teaching today. I still have to evaluate you on what I'm teaching. This is how I'm choosing to do it. It's the same reading as hybrid seven. It should look really, really familiar because it's pretty much the same set of questions. But the only difference is you get to do it over and over and over again until you get it right. Just like your labs, essentially. Um, essentially, it's due, you know, in a week, as usual. And that's, that's it. This one does not require a lot of, um, it's not a practical kind of thing. It's more, do you understand these concepts? And I figured the quiz was the easiest way to do it. All right. So what are we covering today? Before I start through the slideshow, uh, the, today's a, a theory heavy day, but it's the only theory heavy day left of the term, which is good. We're going to cover indexes, views, and something called partitioning. And it doesn't have anything to do with how you separate up a hard drive. For those of you who know what partitioning a drive is, it has nothing to do with that. Kind of. Um, however, it's a gross topic and it's a lot of busy slides. Um, I'm trying to get it dropped from the course outline. <laughs> so, because it's really not an introductory level topic. So I just cover it in bullet points and we're done with it. Okay, I'm going to start with indexes. And as you've noticed, I've got the right week number on the slide this week. And it's been uploaded with the right week number. Um, I actually, you know, I was using half a brain today when I was double checking everything. Okay, indexes. Indexes is a method of speeding up your queries. Um, now, often I use the comparison of an index to a librarian. Now, people don't tend to go to libraries as much as they used to, but it's still a kind of cool place to go look up for books because they'll have uh, books there you never thought of. And their lookup systems are usually completely and utterly useless. Um, usually, if you're trying to find books on a given topic, you might have a 10% chance of actually finding the right one because it's a library. And I know this because I was spent a lot of detentions in the library reorganizing books while I was in high school. I was a good kid. I was just a stupid kid. I got caught doing stupid shit all the time. Super Bowl tag down the hall, good way to get detention. Um, however, if you're trying to find something on a topic, usually the fastest way to add, find it is you go ask a librarian and they'll look it up for you because they, they know the magic sauce. And it just works. Now, indexes in a computer are similar to that in, in the sense of it doesn't improve your target search. What it does, it improves how fast you get to your, what you're after. And let's say we have a relation. In this case, it's really simple. It's a table called person. It has a name, an age, and a city in it. Now, if you do something like this, select star from person where name is equal to Smith, what it does is a, a sequential scan of the database file. Now, you might not realize this, but every table in your database, the content resides on a file on the disk. And that's why database servers are only as fast as the hardware under it. And now, what this does is does a sequential scan of the file. How many of you remember phone books? Okay. Imagine if you were trying to find someone whose last name was Smith, but you actually had to go through all the A's, the B's, the C's before you get to the Smiths. 
And you actually had to go, a, 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 a. oh, now we're into the Bs. And you literally had to go through the whole thing until you hit Smith. It is pretty bad. So that's what a sequential scan does. It's as if you go through every single entry one by one, you're looking at it saying, is the name equal to Smith? No. Is the name equal to Smith? No. Is the name equal to Smith? No. If you only got a couple hundred rows, that'll be like that. If you got 10 million rows, it's going to go, what? I don't think so. Why? Because it's got to read through millions and millions of rows, one after another, saying, is this the right one? Is this the right one? On and on. So what happened is they created a system called indexes. Now, what an index file organization is, is it's a, how can I word this properly? You got the t file that contains the actual data, and then there's other files that look up that contain quick lookups about where certain things are inside that file so you can get to the right spot faster. So records are stored either sequentially or non-sequentially, and each record has an address. This is, this is true whether or not your table is indexed. An index is a, ta a data structure that's used to find the location inside the file faster using whatever criteria. I've got, actually got a diagram on the next slide. Now, when you create a primary key, it is automatically indexed. All primary keys are indexed. They cannot, they cannot not be indexed. It is the requirement of the existence of a primary key. And why would it be important to always index the primary key? Because 90% of the time, that's how you're going to pull data out of the database. Therefore, wouldn't it make sense to be able to pull out the record quickly based on the primary key, thus it's indexed. Um, other fields or combinations of fields can also be indexed. You can index a single field. You can index, you know, a combination of fields. Uh, these are called secondary indexes, or also known as non-unique indexes. These are indexes where you might index phone numbers, people's email addresses, uh, their name. Often, if you want to do a combo index, as in if you do common searches, anybody here ever work for a cell phone company? The, the hand of shame. Anybody here ever work for like Rogers or Fido? Okay, you know when you go change your plan, they always ask you, can I have your phone number, then they ask you for your postal code to verify your identity? It's also because there's some, some needs to actually confirm they actually pulled the right record. They're actually, they actually do a combined index in their case of the, your phone number and the first three digits of your postal code. And it's a combo index because that's how they do 90% of their lookups. If they punch in your phone number and your postal code, ta-da, it'll find that set fast because you're searching a combined index. Now, the most common index structure is known as a B tree. Now, a lot of people call it the binary tree search, which is wrong. People actually do call that that. Actually, I'll even admit it. I thought that's what it was called until about a year and a half ago. Whenever I saw a B tree, my brain said, I'm working computers, that's a binary tree. No, that's not what it is. It's called the best tree. And I guess somebody felt embarrassed by calling it best tree, so they shortened it to B tree. Because I am going to use the best index format ever, the B tree. Or the best tree. And the way it works is it divides the records bit by bit. And as you add more records, it's constantly rebuilding the index. And sometimes you actually have to run special commands to force the index to get rebuilt. And what it does is it'll store all the records. So for example, if you have alphabetical list of people, the first leaf may split right at the L. So everything from A to L on one side, M to N on the other side. Then it'll take that set, split that in half, take the next set, split it in half. In, depending on the database server you're working with, the B tree has a limit of how many depths it goes. MySQL has a limit of four. Microsoft SQL server has a limit of four. Postgres has a limit of six. Why? Because they think they're smarter. Um, actually, it's just because their algorithms are more efficient. Um, they've actually got a couple of other tree structures other than B tree. They've got an H tree, which is 10 layers deep, but it doesn't go quite as wide. 
Um, so in theory, it could go hundreds wide, four deep, assume four deep. And to actually show you how it actually behaves, it's something like this. The first layer, for example, would have F, P, and Z. So it would be everything up to F. The middle one would be everything up to P. And then the one would be everything to Z. And when it breaks down after that, it'll break it down into separate bins, and each of those bins are broken down further. So essentially, if you're looking for Smith with this organization, it would look through the first scan saying, is it less than F? No. Is it less than P? No. Okay, it must be less than Z. It'll jump down to the next set. So anything after P to Z, it'll go, okay. Is it less than R? Is it less than S? Oh, it's more than R, but it's less than S. It'll jump down to the next set. So far, what has it done is it basically searched through two pieces of information instead of millions of rows. And at that point, it'll start getting addresses. Since it goes four down, the next layer down will go, okay, well, is it, say, S L to S M? You know, so it'll do the S up to S L and then maybe everything else after that, and it'll break that down into chunks also. And it'll just keep drilling down. So at most, it has to do four lookups in the index to find the range of records inside the file where your record is. So then what it'll do is say, oh, I know it's somewhere between records 10, say 10 million and 10 million and 25. So it'll, then the database server will jump at 10 million to sequentially scan those 25 to find the ones they're after. And that's what the index does. It's gross when you hear about it like that. Uh, but essentially, it's just like taking up a group of students and dividing it. If I was trying to find one specific person in this group, and I decided to go by location in this room, I could go divide this room in half. Now divide this set in half. Okay, now I'm down two layers. Divide the one of those sets in half, and then divide it in half. I'm down to like four people. I only have to look at four of you at that point to maybe guess what your name is. Because I can't remember names. All right, so at least at most, I only have to guess one in 25 chances of getting it right. And at that point, I could do a sequential scan going, okay, face, name, face, name, and then I get the right name. That's how the indexes work, the B tree indexes. Those are common ones. For example, in MySQL, this is the only index type. Microsoft has Chill Server, they've got two. Uh, Oracle's got three, and I don't remember what they are, but they all support B tree. Uh, Postgres has seven. Why? Because they can. Um, the most commonly used is B-Tree. Why? Because it does the job more than adequately for 95 to 98 percent of the use cases. Some of the other indexes they have um, are hash algorithms uh, so that you need to store based on a fingerprint as opposed to the actual verbiage. Um, do you ever use a database that allows you to search by how something sounds? Right? No, not that sound. Well, sure. It's a, an audio footprint, a fingerprint. I'm talking, if you're not sure how a person's name is spelt, but you know it's Smith, but is it S-M-I-T-H, S-M-I-T-H-E, S-M-Y-T-H, S-M-Y-T-H-E? Well, the technically could be Smith or Smythe, but depending where you come from, it's pronounced the same. I had an Australian student two terms ago, and his name was written Smythe, but he pronounced it Smith. So what that's called, those are, you'd use a, um, a hash algorithm for that so that you could match on the pattern of what the word sounds, it's called the Soundex index. So they got different indexes for different jobs. Um, some of the servers support it, some don't. All right, now how do you create an index? Create index. You create index, you give it a name, you go on, you give it the table name and the fields that are that you're indexing. So create index, name index on person, name. So essentially we're indexing the name of the person and we're calling the index name index. And that's all there is to creating an index. If basically put, it'll take the default index system of the database server you're using once again, MySQL is going to be a B tree. In Postgres, it defaults to B tree. But unless you tell it to use an H tree, which I don't remember what that stands for, but you know. 
or something you know there's various reasons why it could be called that I just don't remember why it's called H tree um, unless you could tell it to use hashing algorithm there's a few different ones you can use um, that's roughly the end of the syntax for it now if you want to create an index on more than one field you just comma separate them like the first example here create index they call the double index in this case on person age and city and so if you run this query, the query optimizer will grab that index. So it will help this kind of a query, but it will not help this query, which is why you need to have two indexes. And in a minute before I get outside of the topic of the indexes, there's some fix when it comes to that. Yes? No, nope, you just keep adding commas. So if, if you mean if you have two or three, two or one or more, one field or two fields? Yeah, no, you just go comma next field, comma next field, comma next field, add infinitum. Uh, you should not index an entire table. I'll explain in a minute why. Okay. Now, you can also use indexes for ranges, especially on dates and numbers. As you can see here, that one I'm indexing an age, and if I go give it a range, it'll work better. And now, why not create indexes on everything? That's a little question at the end of this slide. Okay. Let's just say We have a table that has names in it. And this entry has 35,000 rows by eight columns. No problem. In actual fact, what you don't know, there's actually a hidden column, which is the physical address on where it is in the file. Because even though you might be using an ID, it needs to know where physically it is in the file. So that's the hidden address. Okay, let's just assume this table occupies ten megabytes. Got to be capital B. Megabytes. Okay, cool. So now the primary key gets indexed. Good news is primary keys are usually numeric. So we've got the PK index. That might be occupying one megabyte. So far, so good. We're not using up a lot of room. We have eight columns. Okay, we got a person's name. So we're going to index their name. This index might take up six megabytes, depending on how complex the data is. Now you go and you index their postal codes. Those ones are smaller, it might be three megabytes. Cool. We're doing great. We're going to index their email address and their phone number. say that's uh, five megabytes and their phone numbers could be four megabytes I'm pulling numbers out of my ass but you know I'm estimating okay now we're saying that ah, but we also look up by postal code and phone number so now we create a a phone plus zip index and it's actually going to be a little bit bigger than the phone by itself and the zip by itself because that's just how it works. Okay, so far so good. We're containing 10 megabytes of data. Somebody want to add that up for me really fast? My brain doesn't want to math today. Okay? Okay, so we're storing 10 megs of data but we're storing 26 and a half megs of data to find the data. 
That's not bad. It's only 35,000 rows. Let's go to 35 million rows. These numbers grow with the same set of zeros. That's add three zeros. Suddenly we're going to be using uh, twenty six megs of space for one index. And again, people are saying, well, it's only twenty six megs. It can't be that big. What are you talking about? It's tons of space. This is one table. For example, our product tracking database where I work sits at uh, about uh, four and a half gigabytes right now. And that's not even the indexes, that's the raw dump without the indexes. Actually, on disk, once it's imported and everything, I think it occupies almost 20 gigs of disk space. It's huge. Now, here's one of the catch-22s. You've indexed almost everything, right? One, two, three, four, five of the eight fields have been indexed. Fantastic, you can do great searches. As long as you're only searching on one field at a time. If you want to search for more than one field at a time, it's got to start having compound indexes. Still okay. We're good. Now, we're going to update one row of data. And we're going to update the person's name, their postal code, and their phone number because they just moved. Individual A got married, decided to take their spouse's last name. And then they moved to another town. Got a new phone number. How many pieces of data did we just update? Three. Technically. So what happens now is, on the, in that case, we would update. We'd hit this piece of information. We'd hit this piece of information. We'd hit this piece of information. And then we'd hit this piece of information. So every single time we change one piece of information, it's got to touch the actual table itself, plus three other tables. So you're updating a person's name and phone number, and you have to do four write operations, but each of those write operations also have at least a matching seek. So you change a person's name and phone number, you're doing four. Basically, the server is doing four operations. You, you only do the one, but the server is doing four things for every single thing you make a change. Now, for those that work in certain industries, you know all about entering data for a customer. And after you've entered the first screen, it goes next screen, and you've got to go confirm all that crap a second time, even though it shouldn't need to be. Or you go to the next screen, and the next screen, and the next screen, and you just keep going through screen after screen because you've got to make sure everything's cascading properly. Uh, a lot of systems have gotten better, but I remember some old green screen systems I've worked with that were like that. You change the customer's postal code, it would actually jump you to the order screen now if you want to update all their orders. Then it would jump you to the next screen to make sure that, you know, they're not duplicate customer information. It would just cascade. So what's happening now is every single time you do a write operation, it's got to do four operations instead of one. Well, technically, when you do a write, it does two. It does a read, then it does the write. In this case, it's got to do a read, it's got to do a write, it's got to do a read. It's got to do a write. Oh, it says, hang on, some last name changed enough that they're not in the same spot in the index anymore. Go delete the old record, insert them over here instead in the index. Go to the next one. You can see how expensive this starts getting. Uh, indexes can add uh, up to 40 to 50% overhead when you're writing, uh, updating, and deleting data. So on an insert and update or delete, indexes can add up to 40%. It's expensive. It happens like that for the most part, pretty instant. But let's do a you know high transaction database, such as the CRA, or you know a bank, or um, Rogers. Their database sucks, but you know Rogers. The data constantly is constantly being updated, and the indexes use up tons of space, and they eat up tons of resources every time you change something it's got to do it so a lot of systems what they do is they'll have a nightly job that runs every night and it basically rebuilds the indexes nightly so what it does it does what it does it does a what they call a best index update so it'll shove it into the right spot 
And then every night it'll rebuild the index. It, delete, it literally deletes the index and recreates it so that it has the optimal distribution of records. Whereas before, it'll just take one record out here, move it over there. It might not be the optimal breakdown because you might have bumped records out of a bin that shouldn't be there. But because it's not a rebuild, you know, you might end up with some bins that are a little out of balance from the others. Because the B tree index is trying to keep the bins numerically even. <coughs> so if you've got 10,000 rows, the next bin will be 5,000 to 5,000. The next bin will be 2,500 and 2,500 times 4. Then the next bin after that would be 2,500 divided by 2, which is 1,250. Oh, no, no, no. And breaks it down like that. So when you do a write, it actually does a best write until you do a, re a rebuild. And when you rebuild, you've got to rebuild all the indexes, except for the primary key because you can't. But that one's pretty obvious anyways. Um, now, which leads me to the second problem. If we go back to the previous slide just for a second, where this index would help with this query, but not this query. The query optimizer, something that we haven't talked about, and we're really not going to talk about it other than right now. When you write a query, what the database server does, it tries to find the most efficient way to retrieve the data out of the database. What happens if you, you know, if you only have one or two indexes, it's an easy shot. The database server looks at it and goes, Oh, you're not retrieved from the primary key, but you're searching against the name. We have a name index. I'll use that index. But let's say you go search by name and then by zip code. It'll go, oh, well, I'm, I can only use one index. Not true, but I'll go with you can only use one index. Which one am I going to use? It's going to take a guess at which is the best index. And it actually keeps track historically of which one's more successful. And it optimizes itself that way. <coughs> However, it has to guess for the right one. How about if you had, I'm searching by zip code and by email. Again, you've got two indexes, but it might actually see that there's a phone in zip, and it might try using this one instead. So one of the catch-22s is if you start creating too many indexes, the query optimizer no longer knows what to do. Going, I've got too many ways to find the data. So I'll pick the first one I see. We're going to go with that answer. Um, anybody here ever feel overwhelmed by your choices? Do you pick the first one you see? Okay, nobody wants to admit to that one, but we've all done it. So that's indexes. There's not a lot to it other than understanding that they're great to make queries faster, especially if you're searching substring searches like for part of a name and that kind of stuff. However, there's a cost, but it's like anything else, right? You're storing 10 megs of data, but you end up using 26 and a half megs of space just to make sure you can find anything on any given table. And this is a common mistake done by um, beginners is, oh, indexes are great. I'll index everything. No. It's, it's not good. Um, because it's expensive and it uses up resources. Yes? No, no, the index is permanent. You create an index, the server grinds for a while, creates a structure, and it's stored permanently. Yeah, you go create index, give it a name on whatever table, go, it'll sit there and grind for a while, and then come back. And just to give you an idea how much it can improve the performance of a query. Um, recently, we had uh, our order ordering system where I work is kind of weird um, because we distribute our software using license files. Now, these license files are configured real time. So when we ship the product to the customer, the license file gets created right then and there and sent to them. What was happening is some of our customers, and nobody ever thought of this years ago, um, we have some OEMs, so we resell our software. We end it. It's sort of a bit like the sneakers I'm wearing, right? They're RBX sneakers, but we all know those are actually made by Reebok. But they're RBX. because They're rebranded Reebok. We do the same thing for some of our customers because, you know, they pay us lots of money and we 
take our name off the software and we put their name on the software. It's okay. That's how OEM stuff works. However, we, a couple, about six months ago, we had a customer say, we want 2,500 licenses in one go. We're like, no problem. And then somebody tried to pull up that order. And it sat there for 20 minutes, collecting all the information about all 2,500 packages, all the different lights, the bits and features that go into each package, what modules get turned on, what modules get turned off, what the serial numbers are of the security devices that go with everything. It took forever. I'm like, this is terrible. I didn't know, of course, they were impacting everybody else. So I said, okay, I got to do something about this. So I took some time some, to index. And what did I index? I indexed my foreign keys because they don't get indexed by default. So anybody want to take a guess what the performance increase was? By the way, we never figured out how long it was going to take to run. The server died at the half hour mark. So we went to an infinite amount of runtime down to 42 seconds. Why? Because there was indexes. The server knew how to grab the data in the most efficient manner. I needed to create three indexes and I shaved off infinite time. It's amazing. It's like Doctor Who in reverse. But indexes are great. Indexes are expensive. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how do you, okay, that's a good question. So essentially what he just asked, I'll repeat the question for the camera. It's the first time the whole term. I remember to do it. The question was roughly, how do you know what to index and does the query optimizer, how does it decide what it's going to use? Okay, two separate questions, similar answers. The query optimizer basically looks at what's in your where clause and then it looks at what columns are included in the where clause and it tries to find the index that matches the closest. If it doesn't find an index that matches the whole set, it'll try to find the one that matches the most number of columns and use that one. If you happen to have two indexes with two separate columns that aren't related at all, it'll actually use both of them to optimize the filter, but it's not as efficient as if you had a two column index. It might be, you know, 25% more expensive than if it was using a good index, the perfect match. That's what it does. Now, how do you decide what you're going to index? Um, essentially, you find out the usage pattern of your end users. So if you've got a data entry system where they always look everything up by phone number, that's a good one. If you always look things up by a person's postal code, that's also a good one, or by email address. Things like a person's name is OK to index, depending if that's a common way of searching. Uh, I can guarantee that the name search is usually one of the last searches a company will use. <laughs> because you can punch in a phone number and pull up everybody who lives at a given address. Right? This was my favorite thing when before Sears cracked down. I could go into Sears and say, I forgot my Sears card. They, they show me the driver's license. There you go. Like, and then say, what's your phone number? Punch in my phone number, so I'll put it on my wife's card. Actually, for a while, they didn't even ask you for ID. You just gave them a phone number, and they charged that phone, whoever was at that address. It was great. Um, that changed about six years ago. <laughs> but it took them a long time to change. But they could punch in a phone number, and then you'd have a list, and you let the human choose the right one. Because all said and done, even though the computer is really fast for finding a needle in a big haystack, the still the best algorithm, the best system yet to identify data tends to be a human. If you've got three Michael Smiths at a given address, but the last name is spelled differently, the human will pick up the right one faster if they're presented a list. Why? Because our brains are really good at that. Our brains are like one giant index. Everything's always indexed. And that's why you can remember stuff quickly as long as you, you know, commit it to memory. Um, computers, well, not so much. They're getting better, but they're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> spent more time on that than I wanted to. All right, so this is still more index material that I'm talking about now. There's also something called the hash algorithm. And what it does is it hashes the contents of the index 
instead of a B tree, it hashes and basically builds a big sequential list. And it actually does math on worth how far down it's at. This one's not so popular, but it's often used for things like postal codes and phone numbers. Uh, why? Because postal codes have a set size and format. So ideally, like American zip codes, for example, you know, five digits. Well, fine, ten digits, but you know, it works better that way. Um, essentially, what happens is it takes the the data, creates a hash. In other words, it does a fingerprint, and it stores partials in lists. So that way, you can say, oh, the fingerprint is this. It looks like this set, and it'll go, oh, it's somewhere in here, and then it'll reach into that pool and grab that one batch of records and then search through that. It's similar to the B tree, but instead of being a B tree, it's just a big long list and it goes, oh, your hash starts with F. That's right at the end. So it'll go to the end and work its way up. That's how it works. Okay. Now, if you've downloaded this slideshow, you'll notice there's a huge fat note attached to this slide. It's a way better explanation than I can give you. Why? Because I've used hash algorithms, I think, twice in my last, in my career. Considering I got out of school in 96, you know, it's been 21 years, I've used it twice. Uh, why? Because the B-tree was always good enough. <laughs> okay. Unique and non-unique indexes. You can have a unique index. Normally it's used for your primary key. But sometimes, some people insist on using indexes as a rule instead of a lookup method. And they will create a unique index on a column that has no right in being unique. <coughs> for example, actually I can't say it has no right in being unique, but there are other ways of ensuring uniqueness other than creating an index. Um, for example, you could create a unique index on someone's email address so you can never put the same email address in the database twice. Or you could put it on their phone number so the phone, same phone number can never exist twice in the database. Those are unique indexes. Normally, it's used for primary keys. Non-unique indexes, those are ones that group individual entities, yes? Sure, that if you're staying within just one country, probably no problem. Once you start going international, and if you're not tracking the country code because you store the country code separately, you might have start having overlap. Or, for example, the example at Sears. My wife had a Sears account. I had a Sears account. At one point, we lived separately before we started living together. We both had a Sears account. We moved in together. We updated our Sears account to have the same phone number. We're two different people. Phone number cannot be unique because it's not attached to two accounts. It's situational. Yes? It, all right. The, the decision on whether or not an index should be unique or not depends on the designer's assumption based on feedback from their the planning committee, let's call it. No, you can drop an index. So you could start it out. I never said anything about not being able to get rid of them. They're there forever because they exist on the disk. You can drop them and recreate them. You can't change an index, but you can nuke it and recreate it. Um, so yes, theoretically, you could start out with things that are unique, and then you discover that they shouldn't be unique, and you can just drop the, the rule, the index. Yes? Well, you, it's not a structure you touch. You basically, it's as if you went to library and you hire a new librarian, you say, okay, you, you're hired, you do your job. You can't modify that librarian. All you can do is fire a librarian and hire a new librarian. The new librarian might look exactly like the old librarian, but it's not the same librarian. It's her twin sister or her twin or her third brother. 
I'm just saying. You know, there's different ways of, you cannot alter an index, you can create and drop an index. Um, but I, I'm being a bit facetious, I'm, I'm staying at a very basic level. In Oracle, it's possible to alter the index. Man, because you're going to change the hashing algorithm on the index because you want to keep the same name. But the amount of work required to do that is not worth the effort. If you're better off just dropping the index and recreating a new one with the same name. So, yeah, you don't you don't change indexes. You create them; they're maintained by the server. So it's a hands-off kind of event. It's a good thing. It's one don't touch. Um, then, of course, as I described, there's the non-unique indexes. I spoke about those already. Now, I've got two slides of rules. Rule number one. You should use them on large tables. On small tables, it's not worth it. Like 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 thousands, upon thousands of rows. Look up tables for like the list of countries, not worth it. Um, normally, the rule is if there's less than a thousand rows, it's not worth it. You index the primary key of each table. That's a given because you don't have a choice but do that. Index search fields, in other words, fields that you often see in the where clause. If you see it show up in the where on a regular basis, maybe you should index those. Why? It'll optimize the query optimizer. Um, believe it or not, it improves the order by and the grouping also. So if you see the fields appearing in the group by and the order by again, you may want to contemplate adding those to the list of things that are indexed. Um, now there's a the last slide looks kind of funny. When there's more than 100 values you should index, honestly, the servers today are so fast that you could actually go, you know, if there's more than 1,000, less than 1,000. Like, for example, the database you guys have been using for this lab, these last couple of labs, that ThinkCube database, has 100,000 rows in the middle. There's no indexes except for the primary keys. I created none except for those of you that have really shitty laptops, and I feel bad for you. But for those of you that have got crappy laptops and you've noticed you type in the query and it takes 15 seconds to come back out of 100,000 rows, that's not bad. Really, I mean, you could play, if you want to experiment on how well it would improve, feel free to create indexes on your ThinkCube database. It won't hurt. Then you can try the same queries that you did earlier that you know you could feel it go, oh, for a second and see if it improves. It's a good experiment for you guys to play with. Um, so they say if there are more than 100 values but less than, but don't bother when there's less than 30. Honestly, if there's less than 1,000, I wouldn't bother unless that table's hit all the time, like constantly being hit. Uh, for example, users. A users table where you're always searching for a username and a password, that might be a good combination to index. Uh, this last point actually comes off of uh, an older piece of information when computers are slower than they are now. But it's still a decent rule, it's just the numbers have changed a little bit. Okay, rules for indexes continued. Avoid indexes for fields with long values. Okay, 50 characters is okay, 255 characters is long. You may want to compress the values first. Now if some of you are going, what the heck do you mean by compressing the value? Apply a hash algorithm to it, hash it, and store a fingerprint of the content of the text. It may work, it may not work, depending on what you're trying to do. <laughs> but essentially, if you're indexing something with a thousand characters, there's no point. You're just creating huge structures for nothing. Um, if the key to index is used to determine the location of a record, use a surrogate key instead of an actual natural key. Why? Uh, I'd have to go back, explain to you why server keys are so good, where our natural keys suck. Um, but by the same token, sequential numbers are indexed really fast. Why? Because numbers are quite quick to index. Numbers are easy to look up. Even a sequential scan through an index, a numeric list is fast because the database server will actually use a bit of least time math. It'll go, oh, I'm looking for a row 5,063. How many rows in the database? 1,000. Okay, well, we know we don't need to go start before 500. It'll jump to 500 and scan from there. 
Numbers are easy. Um, database servers may have limits of how many indexes you can have per table. Um, and number of bytes per index fields. That was true years ago. It's still, you might run into an older server somewhere that has limits. So before you start going crazy creating indexes, you know, you should find out what the limits are of what you're using. But that's like anything else. Documentation. Look it up. Google, Stack Overflow. They're all good places. Um, but normally it's documented what the limits are. Um, <clears throat> and careful when you index stuff that might have nulls. Database servers ignore nulls as much as they can. Therefore, if you have nulls in a field and you index that, it's not going to index the nulls. That means that when you use the query optimizer, any field that is part of that index that has a null actually get ignored. They don't even get found. So careful. If, you, if it's a nullable field, it's probably not worth indexing. Okay, <clears throat> that's the index at the, the end of the index. Done. Now I'm going to talk about, I forgot there's one more topic I want to cover today. And today's kind of a laundry list of all these odds and ends topics. The next one is denormalization. Okay, two slides about this. So far I taught you guys about normalization where you take all your relations and you break them down to the smallest possible pieces to ensure data consistency, speed of updates, reducing the amount of times you need to touch the database, avoid uh, anomalies, that kind of stuff. However, every once in a while you got to go the other way around and you got to denormalize your fantastically structured database. Now, there's some benefits. Normally, it's found at speed because you don't need to join as many tables. Now, like I said before, with a smaller database where you might only have tens of thousands of rows, joins aren't going to be impactful very much. But if you're dealing with a database with tens of millions of rows, those joins start getting expensive because it's got to scan 10 million rows and then 5 million rows. It builds all this crap up in memory and then it shoots it down the pipe. Um, that's the biggest benefit is speeding up queries. The costs, it uses up space. In other words, you're taking a nice structure that already exists that's clean and you're going to dump that data into another table and you're duplicating all this data in another place. Um, and then there's always a risk of damaging your data because now you can stuff can get inconsistent as opposed to the nicely structured, well, structure. Um, now, before I continue past that moment, talk about the normalization, op denormalization opportunities, when would you use denormalization? Usually it's in something called data warehousing. Um, some of you may have heard that phrase, data warehousing. What data warehousing is, is normally nightly, big companies will take the daily transactions put a summarized a summary of each of the transactions and store them in another place so that it's faster to look up information. So that the managers the next day can run reports and they don't have to run a report against, you know, 22 tables with 10 million rows each. It runs against one table where it doesn't need to do any joins. It's just one wide row with, you know, customer order product, customer order product, and it's all on one row, so you can, you can do math quickly that way. Um, I know for a while, I know Algonquin has a business intelligence course, a BI course, and that's part of the content of that, is learning how to denormalize the data. Um, I just don't know if they offer it, where they offer it. Um, but some of you might remember a company called Cognos. Yeah. Cognos was a business intelligence company. They actually, their software, where you could point it at a database server, you tell it what the queries would generate this report, and it would actually, every night, run that query, create a denormalized snapshot of the data, and then you could run the reports against that. That's what they did. Um, 
Amazon offers a similar service it, to denormalize your data. That's, you know, all you're doing is you're taking a nicely structured data and you're baking flat files out of it so there's easier to search. Um, okay, so common opportunities. If you have a one-to-one -one relationship, so you have a some unknown reason you have two tables that are re identical, related one-to-one, -one, you, and you denormalize, you just put everything into one table. Um, an associative entity. If you've got an order and products, when you denormalize it, you literally have one row that has an, the order information and one of the products. The next row would be the same order information with the second product. The third row would be same order information with the third product. Uh, why would you want to do that? Because it's fast to search. Because you can summarize quickly based on pieces of information. Um, reference data. For example, when I had you guys build up your customer records, you have a customer with a province or state ID and a country ID. When you would denormalize that for faster searching later, when you build your data set, you'd actually, instead of storing the country ID, you actually store the name of the country, store the name of the province. Which leads me to some of the risks. Now, denormalization can increase the chance of errors and inconsistencies, and it reintroduces anomalies, and it can force reprogramming. Because if the business rules change, that means what goes into these denormalized tables needs to change also. <clears throat> now, now, where was I going with that? I was headed somewhere. Then I read the next point on my thing and I lost it. Um, the denormal, yeah, so it increases all these big, these risks, which leads me to the concept of normally these denormalized tables are not tables that a, an end user updates. So for example, you're looking up a report the next day of what the sales the day before were. You're not going to modify the data in the, de uh, the denormalized data set because it's kind of dumb because it's not going to reflect on the true transactions anyways. Normally the denormalized data is a bin that gets updated daily, nightly, monthly, weekly, whatever, and it is stored in a more or less read-only format as far as the end users are concerned. It's only for report for most part. Okay, so sometimes you want to avoid denormalization because, you know, there's danger. Um, there's ways of improving the performance of your joins. Um, one of which is proper query design. You don't write stupid queries. In other words, if you need to pull data from three tables, you don't join six tables. Query only for what you need, then only what you need. Uh, organizing the tables in the database. Now, there's two phrases on here, file organization and clustering. Database servers, including Postgres, allow you to organize where the files are actually stored on the disk. And what will sometimes happen is uh, on the bigger installs, so the big Oracle installs, the big Postgres installs, you'll have tons of SSDs. You could have, say, 10 disks in the machine. Now, most people would think at this point, you go, oh, you got 10 disks, why not have a RAID array? Sure. You could do that. Or you could leave each of the disks independent and actually store the customer's table on one disk, the orders on another disk, the order lines on the third disk, so when you do a search, what a lot of people don't understand about the inside of a computer is when it reaches to the disk, if it's one disk, the requests are sequential. That means I can ask for one piece of information, then it asks for the next piece of information, then I ask for another piece of information, right? That takes a while. On the other hand, if it's broken across multiple disks, it's still sequential per disk, but you can ask, three table the three disks in parallel give me the information about this so all three disks will return information at the same time the server at that point is serving up data faster because it's broken down into different locations and you're optimizing literally at this point you talk about hardware level performance increase picture this room imagine there's only one door and then the fire bell goes off and everybody lines up trying to get out that one door. How much more efficient would it be if you could use two doors? Right? You'd drop the amount of time by half because you're doing it in two doors. If you had three doors, you'd drop it by 
you know, two thirds because you can divide the group by three. There is a level of diminishing returns because after a while, you know, how much longer does it take to get two people out of a door as opposed to one person? You know, if I had enough doors for, for every two people, the amount of time taken getting out the door would be roughly the same as if it was two people, three people, or one person. So that, you know, you determine that way. So that's what we talk about when we talk about file organization and clustering. That is definitely an advanced database server topic, not introductory level, but it, the concept should be at this point that there are ways of optimizing your, your searches by not necessarily doing normalizing your data. Because you spend so much time making sure your data is nicely normalized and nicely organized, broken down, and then you take the time to break everything apart. Gross. Um, you're better off, it's one of the few cases you can say throw money at it. Normally often with computer problems, you can throw money at it only so far and then it stops. With database servers, magically, the more money you throw at the server, it tends to grow, the better the whole thing works. The more RAM it has, the more disks it's got to work with. Uh, RAID 5 is great. Um, individualized disks are great. Individualized RAID 5 arrays are great. That and I'm not talking hardware. I know, they teach you guys about RAID arrays in Computer Essentials yet? No? I hope they teach that to you guys. Eh. Okay. Uh, this is not a hardware course. Uh, if you're curious what I'm talking about, go look it up on Google. Advantages of RAID 5. And it'll explain it in much better details. Okay. Now this leads me to partitioning. Because believe it or not, that's sort of related to what I was just talking about. We're on slide 15 of 24, and we're at hour one. That the rate we're going will be done in half an hour, if it goes well. Partitioning. Partitioning involves breaking down the data into smaller chunks. And I don't mean by denormalization. You've got, sometimes your data gets so huge that the tables become unmanageable. 10 million rows is not unmanageable. 10 billion rows is un unmanageable. Can you imagine how big the database at the CRA is? You know, they've got records for everything we've all done in here that, that adds an income. Even better, can you imagine how big the database the IRS is? You know, their database is massive. Their po the American population is, you know, 10 times the size of ours. But they track roughly the same information ours does. So it's huge, the amount of information they have. So you've got two partitioning schemes. You've got horizontal and vertical partitioning. Now, you've got horizontal partitioning. That means you're taking the data and you're going to break sets of rows into separate tables. And often what happens for this is people will use um, Date ranges is a good way of doing it. So you'd have a table, orders 2016, and you have an orders table. And at the end of 2017, they recreate the orders table, or they make a copy of it, take your pick, and they rename one to orders 2017. Your data has not been partitioned. That Everything that's related to 2017 is in one bin. Everything in 2015 is one bin. Everything in 2007 is one bin. That means if you need to search, it's in a bin, and it's a very specific bin. Like, I, like I've talked about accountants, right? Some, a couple of people in here have worked with accountants. And accountants love taking their files and taking their little boxes. And at work, for example, he's got, every year he's got a crate of boxes that gets put in safe storage. And they're not marked by year, right? Accounts receivable 2017, accounts payable 2017, payroll 2017. And he's got these boxes, and they're bins. That is horizontal partitioning, where you take the data and you break it into separate bins. Um, it's useful for situations where different users need to access different information. For example, the online transaction processing may need access to this year's records, but the managers may want last year's records. And the business intelligence guys might need access to the last five years worth of records, based on the tables. That'll do that. Um, there's three kinds. Uh, there's key range, has partitioning, and composite partitioning. 
I'm not going to go into details on that one, but if you read chapter 5, chapter 5 goes into detail about what each of these things are. Um, key range is easy to explain though. Dates. Everything in 2015, that's a range. That's the most common partitioning scheme, is breaking it down by a range of values. Um, hash partitioning is doing fingerprints and composite partitioning, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's usually a combination of the two. So you got a range with a fingerprint. Um, then you got vert vertical partitioning. This is taking a table and breaking it down into smaller chunks. So instead of breaking the data down into smaller chunks, so that's why it's called horizontal, because you're breaking it row by row, the verticals, you're taking the table and you're slicing it this way. So you basically take this huge monolithic table and you're breaking it down into smaller chunks, and then you have a bunch of tables that are one-to-one -one relationships. So for example, you can have a table that has a person's name, phone number, and their address. That's all of a sudden table one. Then in table two could be their SIN number and their uh, billing address, their credit card information. Then you could have a third table with their preferences and that kind of thing. So you could break down the data in separate pieces this way. Um, this is useful for under two circumstances. Um, different users need to access different columns. In other words, you could give people permissions to just see the person's contact information because they don't need to see the guy's SIN number. And then, you know, we don't need to see the preferences. Um, it's often used for security. Um, what's, the, what's the term? Compartmentalization. In other words, each department only gets to see certain things. And actually, depending on what industry you've been in, you've probably experienced it. People that work in the banking industry know all about how you can't see certain things. Because you're not allowed to. But actually, i got to be careful. The tellers can see certain things, but not necessarily everything. And then you've got the managers that see a little bit more, and the branch managers see a little bit more. And then on and on, because, you know, th what they're allowed to see gets wider and wider and wider. And it's controlling by permissions. Uh, the military knows all about breaking things down and who's allowed to see what. The guy digging the ditch doesn't know shit. But the person above him actually knows why he's digging it. He might know where he needs to dig the hole. The person above him knows why the person needs to dig the hole. Right? Depending on where high up you are, you see different things. That's called vertic vertical partitioning. Now, the cool part with the vertical partitioning is, remember pre a slide ago I talked about how you can separate tables on different disks? You can actually separate the vertical partitions on separate disks. So that maybe the customer's contact information is on a, on a really fast NVMe drive, but then you could have their you know, SIN number and stuff on a spin disk because not as many people use it. They're going to use cheaper hardware because the spin disks technically last longer than solid state drives, theoretically. Right? I still don't know which one's longer lasting, but in theory, the spin disks, the, uh, what they call the enterprise grade ones, should last longer. So you can actually separate them to different medias of access so that why waste the resources of a really fast disk and something gets access once every 2,500 queries. So you could optimize that way. <coughs> and then you've got combinations of horizontal and vertical. That really gets messy. Because you can have a nice table, and then in the end you end up with like, say take this nice table and you divide it in two pieces vertically, and then you break it down horizontally. Suddenly instead of one table, you might have two tables, four tables, six tables. Every time you partition horizontally, you're going to add another table. Okay, partitioning pros and cons. Advantages of partitioning. Records that are used together are grouped together. In other words, uh, who remembers defragmenting their hard drive? So it's funny, I say that, and it's people above a certain age group remember this experience. Right? My computer's running slow. That's before the SSDs. Before your solid state drive showed up to the party, you had to defragment your drive on a regular basis. What would it do? The really good defragmenting software would take all the files you access regularly and put them all together on the disk, on the outside edge of the disk, because that's where it's fastest. That partitioning, you're physically planning that structure. Um, local optimization, each partition can be optimized for search. That means you can create an index on a person's phone number and their postal code on one of the partitions. 
And then you could create an index for their SIN number on a different partition. And the good news is you update the person's address information, it doesn't touch the SIN index. You update their SIN number, which you should never do, but it's possible because your identity was stolen. It doesn't touch the other tables. It optimizes the writes because the data has been broken down into smaller chunks. It does, partitioning does break the rules a little bit of uh, proper denormalization because you got this whole one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one bit. Um, but sometimes when you're dealing with tens of millions of rows, you end up having to break things down because that's life. Uh, security. Data not relevant to certain users is segregated. If they're not allowed to see the SIN numbers, congratulations, they're not going to see the SIN numbers. Hot damn. Uh, recovery and uptime. Smaller files are faster to back up. 10 million rows with 25 columns takes a long time to back up. If you're just going to back up the one table, and a lot of these backup services actually run in parallel, it'll be faster because you're backing up smaller pieces. Um, load balancing. You can store the partitions on different disks. That means the I.O., the pipe, doesn't get clogged to the disk. I hate using the expression of a pipe, but it's what it is. Right? You've had the, anybody here ever have a bucket with a hole in it? You fill it full of water, and the water slowly drains out of that hole. Then you get mad, and you punch the bottom out, and there's another hole. And then the water drains twice as fast because you got two holes. So you add another hole, it drains three times as fast because you got three holes. Same deal. The more you break it out across multiple disks, the faster it's going to be because your pipes aren't getting filled up. Uh, there's disadvantages. Inconsistent speed access. Let's say you need to do a join and one of the partitions is on an SSD, the other one's on a spin disk. I'll give you three guesses what the rule is of how fast it's going to be. It's like, an, A? Yes. It's just like when you're doing a team activity. The team's only ever as fast as the, as the slowest member. Queries are the same. Uh, complexity. Guess what? Partitions are usually not transparent. It sucks. It means that you actually have to write your queries taking into account the fact that these partitions exist. Now, some servers, such as Oracle, and I'm one that always derides a little bit on Oracle, but Oracle has what they call transparent partitioning, where you can have a table and you can create partitions of it, and it's just basically a subgroup of that table. So when you search against that table, it searches across all the partitions unless you tell it not to. That's actually, I think, you'll, if I remember it, you learn how to do that in the Oracle course. Um, and of course, it uses up more room because you've got to store the structures and store all the bits and pieces that go with it. And update times might take longer depending on if you're going across multiple tables. It's like anything else. Okay. <laughs> Actually, it's, I already explained how this works, so I'm going to skip this slide. But it might be worth reading for you guys because there's a little bit of a, a note on the slideshow. Okay, defining views. We're on topic number three or four, and then we're done. I'm on slide 18 of 24. Let's see how, how well we can get through this. A views. Views are relations. So, so far you guys know that tables are relations. Views are relations, except they're not physically stored. They are a virtual definition of a table. You can use it for presenting different information to different users to hide the complexity of the database structure behind the scenes. If you are got your data partitioned to a bunch of tables, you can create a view that makes all the partitions look as a single table. That's what views are for. Now, for example, we have a, a relation called employees, and there's the social security number, their name, their department, project, and salary. By the way, these are ter terrible tables, but you know, for simplicity's sake, like they're all denormalized. And I create a view called developer. And as you can see right here, it's actually an SQL statement. So the way the syntax works is, you know how you do create table, create index? You go create view, you give it a name, and then you use the keyword as, and then you feed it an SQL statement. And what it then does is it basically creates a virtual table, virtual table in memory of that query. It, every time you select from that view, it actually runs that query you've stored inside of it. And every year I use this example, and I know my database prof, 
probably every time I say this, he's gonna sit there and he gets that burning sensation in the back of his head. And he's probably thinking, dancing, something stupid right now. The way I try to get you guys to understand what a view is. Okay, how many of you understand the concept of bookmarks on your web browser? Okay. Sorry, Emerson, for saying that. <laughs> I was up all this. This is sort of like your bookmarking of a query. You write this big, brutal query. For example, one of those wonderful queries you had for Lab 8, or one of those wonderful queries you had for the assignment Part 2. You know that nice big one that has a union, not a union, but a, a subquery and you know a couple of joins? You could rewrite that as create view complicated query as, as that, then you can go select start from complicated query. You never don't need to type up the whole query again. You've stored the structure, the command that would build the same data back. And once you've done that, a little bit of magic happens. You can it's treated just like a normal table. It uses the same thing as the same index performance improvements. You can do full joins with it. Um, everything you could do with a normal table, you can do with a view. Sort of. Uh, there are a few limitations, and I'll explain those in a moment. But with this view that's being created here, somebody that works in payroll, payroll could see employees, but you could actually give other people access only to developers. So they only have, they have read write view, they have a read view of developers, but they can never see anything of employees. So they can retrieve data out of imp out of developers, and you get their name and their their name and their projects and no other information. So if you go select star from developers, you get people's name and their projects, but you don't get their SIN number, you don't get their salary, you don't get their department. You just find out who works as a developer. <clears throat> okay, a slightly different view. As you can see, actually there's a bunch of different views on this. And this one just shows that I'm creating a view called Seattle View. Um, and as you can see, I've got a dash in this, which is terrible. But this actually, I grabbed this example out of a textbook. And they actually used that because uh, whatever database they used allowed dashes and object names. But this has something called Seattle View. And as you can see here, it has a join. It's got a search. So now what it does, it creates a virtual table. So you know when I taught you guys about subqueries where it creates a temporary table in memory? Views are the exact same thing. It runs the content of the view, stores it in memory, gives it that name, takes a somewhat complicated query and moves on. Later on, we could use it like this. So select from style view and product, and then it's a really old style join. And instead of grabbing, you know, what was there before, which was select from person and purchases, where the city is equal to Seattle, it's doing this. Now, what happens? There's a little bit more SQL here. And as you can see, I color coded all kinds of stuff. When you create from the view, what it does, the optimizer actually takes the time, and they, it's called decomposing the view. So it takes the original query you wrote, brings it back out, and tacks on the new pieces and runs that. So it's called, basically the view is there to bookmark a search that you've done. And then when you use that search, and if you if it's just a straight up select from that view, it's great. It doesn't need to decompose it, it just runs it. But if you start joining stuff to it, it'll actually decompose the original view. And if you go back two slides, you'll see, you know, um, some of this stuff is in here from the other one, some is from another one. It'll basically take the two queries, find the most efficient way to write them, and run it. So when we're done here, take the slides and compare what's on each of the slides for these. So that would be slide um, 19 to 21, and you'll see what it's actually doing. Um, Yeah, but this one, it's, it's person, it's joining person to purchase, and it's joining product to purchase here. Um, that one's joining purchase because the sale view's already got the, um, actually you're right, that should say product. You're right. Um, I don't know why it says that, but anyways, we'll have to fix that on the slide. 
Um, but that's essentially what it's going to do is break it down like that. That's the problem when you use other people's materials and you don't actually proofread it. Okay. There's two types of views. There's virtual views. Those are used in a database. They're computed on demand. So picture it when you watch your, your videos on demand, you're watching Netflix. You know how it kind of buffers before you start? And then it starts playing because it's got to collect enough data to actually start showing you stuff? Virtual views are similar to that. When you go to run from it, it actually runs the entirety content first of that query to figure out what it needs to do with it. It's calculated every single time. The perk of a, a virtual view, which is what basically is a normal view, is that it's always up to date. It matches everything that's already in the database all the time. It's real time. You have something called materialized views. Those are used in data warehouses. Those are pre-computed. That means nightly this data gets updated. And then it gets stored. But the problem is it can have stale data. That means the data is not always up to date because it needs to update the view. Remember earlier when I talked about denormalization and taking the records and storing them off separately? Those denormalized views are basically materialized views. So the denormalized structures are basically materialized views. <laughs> There's big advantages to materialized view. They're fast. They're not computed on the fly. So for example, a regular view hits a database with 10 million rows, it's got to scan all 10 million rows. The materialized view, on the other hand, only scans the applicable records because they're physically there, they already exist. So it, it, you know, the performance is better because of it. Um, but there's always a risk because it, like it says here, you may have stale data. That means that there might be some leftover data from somewhere. Let's say it updates at midnight every night and the guy's running his reports at 6 p.m. the next day, you don't have any of the data for that day until the next day. And if the nightly update routine breaks, which happens, then you have stale data because the data is not updating. The data gets staler. So instead of being day-old bread, it's three-day-old bread. It's gross. Okay. Updating views. There are some basic rules. 90% of the time, you cannot update views. You can't, remember I said earlier, basically views are just like tables. They can do pretty much anything another table can do except for a few things. One of the big catches of inserting into a, you can't really use views for inserts, updates, and deletes unless you've pre-structured your views in such a way that you can. For example, we had the view that I had earlier created about developers. And basically we know that developers only has two columns, names and projects. So if we did insert in developers that, you can see what it'll do is it'll actually convert it into insert into employees, but it'll have a null for their social security number, a null for the department, a null for their salary. And if any of those are required fields, guess what's going to happen? It's going to bomb out, which means that you cannot ever insert into that view. So where does that lead us? That leads us to the point where if you're going to create views that are what they call updatable views, you have to include, you have to make sure your primary keys are auto-incrementing or auto-populating. You have to make sure that every column that is required by the database is also included in the view. In other words, in this case, if their salary is required, you'll never be able to insert into it because the salary is not being provided because the view doesn't even know the salary exists. Therefore, the insert will fail. And in the end, you have to make sure that every column that is required is included in the view, which at that point you might have data leakage. Therefore, you must just be inserting into the real table. It's situational. Uh, should you create another view to make your life easier? It depends. No, views take up no space. Views, like virtual views, not materialized view. Materialized view to actually take space because you're actually writing records. 
virtual views take up the space of the actual definition, and that's it. So in other words, you have an object in the database, in this case called developers, and then there's the actual SQL statements actually stored inside of it. So the actual, uh, most of the library occupies the space of the query plus a little bit. Well, they're, they're ready-made subqueries, they're ready-made aliases, they're like derived tables, but they're permanently stored derived tables. No, they create a virtual table, not a virtual column. It's the same thing as a derived table. And a lot of people that don't like using derived tables will use views. They'll create the view, store that, and use it. For example, MySQL got subqueries seven, eight years ago. So up till about, I'm, I'm pulling that number, it might be a little longer than that, maybe 10 years, but for the longest time, MySQL did not have subqueries. The only way you could achieve a derived table, like, you know, select star from derived table, is to actually create a view and you go select star from this table. That's how you'd use the derived view. So some people will sometimes use derived, will use views in place of derived tables because they don't need to remember what that structure is because it's already been made for them. That's part of the planning process, the development life cycle. Um, you, yeah, that's part of the design process. And, and those in CP, you actually have an SLDC course, so software life development cycle, uh, software development life cycle, or SDLC. Um, the database has a database development life cycle. It's pretty much the same thing as the software one, except it's specific to the data. Uh, the CET students, I don't remember if you actually get one or not. Yeah, I think you get a project management course, which is not quite the same, but similar. Uh, it's worth investigating, if you're interested in that kind of stuff further, what the cycle cycle is for that. Um, okay. Which is, earlier we are talking about the updatable and non-updatable view. But essentially, um, this is a non-updatable view because there's none of the, some of the fields aren't there, there's no primary keys. How do you actually add this data? Guess what? We have to add the person record and then we add the product record and then we add the purchase record. You have to add all the bits and pieces one by one because you don't have an updatable view. You just have to be careful. Updatable, uh, views can be updated and inserted into but only if you've got all your bases covered. But as he came up with, views are good to use as derived tables. So if you want to avoid writing these, you know, from brackets, big long subquery close brackets, you can create a, a, a view that contains that structure all the time, and therefore it's already optimized for you. Makes life a little easier. <clears throat> no, it's an update statement. It's an update statement. You can't override a view. No, an actual fact, which leads me to a few of the other gotchas for views, and that's not on the slides. Um, but there are a few gotchas for the views, and then we'll be done. Gotcha number one, you can't change the structure of the view. If you want to add a new column to the view, guess what you have to do? You drop it, recreate it. Some of the database servers allow you to do a create or replace command. You know, I have create, view, whatever it's called. You could do create or replace. Um, Postgres theoretically supports that functionality as long as you don't change the number of columns being returned. Therefore, if you need to change the number of columns being returned, you've got to drop the view, recreate the view. <clears throat> I, get, I get caught with that all the time because I forget that I'm not allowed to do that. Because in MySQL, I can't the joy of working in more than one database system at the same time. Um, that's gotcha number one. Gotcha number two. Um, 
if the underlying table structure changes, the view does not know what happened. For example, you remove a column, uh, so you got two or three tables that are being joined. And you remove one of the tables because it's not needed anymore. And you don't change your view to reflect that table is gone. That view stops working. And so you define it. It's a bit like your bookmarks in your browser, right? You create a bookmark. A year later, you go, oh, what's this bookmark? Where you click on it, and it's gone because the site changed. The bookmark no longer valid, no longer worked because the structure behind the scene changed. <clears throat> Views are exactly the same thing. So it's sort of like you're sitting on a chair and somebody cuts off a leg of the chair and then suddenly the chair is not working, but you know you think the chair is still there until you try to sit down on it. Then it blows up. It returns an error of some sort. Um, the last, the last gotcha with the views, which I think is on one of the previous slides, is it can be uh, if the underlying query is not written properly. Actually, it's not on one of the other slides. It's just something you should know. If the underlying query is terrible, the view will be terrible. So if you're doing these, this really complex query and the joins are bad, it's using bad indexes or whatever, the view will be just as bad as the original query because it's using the original query. So the view is only ever as good as the structure that defines it. <clears throat> so those are the gotchas. Uh, one of the pros is, remember I talked about partitioning a table where you break up the table in pieces going sideways or in pieces going horizontally or vertical. You can use the view to hide all these things. And it's not going to help you for the inserts, but let's say you've got a, the customer record, is a, yeah, it's broken down into four tables, and you need to see data from all four tables. It wouldn't be, it'd be so much better if you go select star from view full customer record as opposed to select star from customers join secure information, join preferences, join something else. So instead of having this big long set of joins, you got <coughs> you just got this one view and that's it. So that's the big perk for the views, is when you start partitioning data, you can use the views to hide the underlying structure for the developers. Okay, that's slide 24 of 24. <clears throat> now, Don't forget, if you haven't gotten your stuff done yet, you've got uh, three and a half hours, minus one minute. Um, other than that, I'll see you guys in lab. And next week, we start with some of the harder topics. Lab 9 due next week.